Hello, my name is Lisa Roger from Otimo, and I want to welcome you to the CIO podcast. On this show, we seek to share insights and experiences from the world's leading CIOs and transformation agents. So tune in if you're a CIO or an entrepreneur looking for inspiration. Welcome. All right. Well, welcome everybody to another episode of CIO Podcast with Lisa. And I am so excited today to introduce everyone to Dr. Lawrence Anderson. Welcome. I'm so happy to have you here today. I'm happy to be here in this cool Friday morning. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to come. This beautiful spring morning, I've got my daffodils from the yard over my shoulder here, just to remind us that it's spring and it's pretty out. Nice, nice. Well, I want to introduce everyone to you because you are accomplished in so many ways and um, it's just fun. I I learned a little bit about you, more about you uh, just from this. So I I hope everybody else will be just as amazed as I was. But let let me tell you all a little bit about um, Dr. Lawrence Anderson. So before launching his consulting firm, most recently, he served as the chief technology and operations officer for the National Student Clearinghouse. Uh, which is so cool, um, where he spearheaded the multi-year effort to reimagine the American data ecosystem leveraging cloud-native microservices. Dr. Anderson served as dual roles as the Deputy Chief Information Officer and the Chief Information Officer for the Office of the Secretary for the U.S. Department of Commerce. Dr. Anderson also served as Associate Chief uh, CIO or Chief Information Officer at the U.S. Office of Personnel Management, OPM. In addition, Dr. Anderson served as OPM's IT Transition Executive, where he was responsible for managing and integrating OPM's complex information technology systems with the Department of Defense and GSA. He also served as the Acting Chief Information Officer for Strategy and Policy, where he was responsible for IT strategy, investment management, budget, data management, and vendor management. Throughout Dr. Anderson's career, he's been focused on strategic transformational issues ranging from shared services, IT modernization, digital transformation, which we'll be talking about today, artificial intelligence, robotic process automation, and most recently, M&A, mergers and acquisitions. As an experienced executive, Dr. Anderson devotes much of his spare time to coaching and mentoring, a passion of my heart, uh, especially emerging leaders, which have led to measurable substantive improvements for the individuals and their organizations. But some really interesting, cool stuff about Dr. Anderson I want to share with you guys. He's a third degree black belt in karate and specializes in teaching self-defense techniques for women and children. He's also an accomplished musician. If you duck your shoulder, you can see his uh, equipment there in the background, his, mu- his uh, electric bass guitar. Uh, he was a musical, he's the musical director for his church and um, performs with some local bands as well. He's earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in politics from Catholic University of America, a Master's of Science in Management Information Systems from the University of Maryland Graduate School of Management and Technology. And lastly, a doctor, a doctorate of management from the University of Phoenix School of Advanced Studies as a graduate of the Federal Executive Institute. Wow. Wow. Amazing, Larry. Well, what thank a, you. <laughs> thank you what, for a, what a cool <laughs> background you have. It's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just uh, we could probably talk all day just sure. on like on your background. Um, but I'd love to hear, especially because it's somewhat new, your mm-hmm. latest adventure. Can you tell everybody about this firm that you started? So, so I started a company, um, um, solopreneur company right now. It's called Transcend Digital Solutions. And there's a reason behind that, which we're likely going to talk about a lot today. And that is a, uh, an organization that's focused on digital transformations, particularly for the small and mid-sized organizations. The large organizations and the governmental organizations tend to have a CIO working on those types of things for them, but the small and mid-sized organizations need these same types of services and these same types of transformations, but they don't have anybody to help them with these types of efforts, particularly in it pertains to strategy. So that's kind of where I come in to help those small to mid-sized organizations. First, figure out what the technology is, but also, 
The other parts of it, and this is why I talk about in a call it transcending digital, because it's not just about the technology part of it. What about our people? What about our processes? What about the organizational culture? And all those things go hand in hand uh, to foster a digital transformation effort. And that's essentially the premise of either the company and the premise of what I bring to bear for small to mid-sized organizations. I love it. That is so good. That I mean, and I think about all the firms that need that because often mm -hmm. small firms, you know, either IT is they find the person who's got the most skills and is willing to <laughs> like put in the extra effort to make things happen because you know you're scrambling when you're really small. And then the mid-sized firms, they might have a you know someone in charge of IT, but maybe doesn't have that strategic background. Um, you know who can help with those you know partnerships and alignments and lining what you're doing from a technology perspective to strategy. Right, and I think often with this, when the small to mid-sized companies kind of started, you know, they they really didn't think about their co company as a mature organization. And they just start to mature if they start to adopt these te digital technologies. It was fine to have that person who's on staff or even hi you hired to kind of work with your IT stuff. But as you start to really focus on strategy, as you start to focus on how do we get the most bang for buck and how do we leverage technology to be ultra competitive, uh, to improve our margins, you need to bring, you know, bring in somebody to help with those types of things so we can actually leverage technology to stay ahead of the curve rather than being, um, let's say this, um, misplaced or displaced by technology or just by essentially, you know, um, we, we, we call the word uh, disruption, a digital disruption. And that's always an ever present thing, particularly for the small to mid sized organization. So I, I help to try to, 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 you know, to hope uh, the, the stable of digital disruption for the small to mid sized organizations also. And you know what? I just, I just popped in my head. We'll keep talking about this first. Um, you know, sometimes the smaller, more nimble firms can take advantage of disruption quicker. Absolutely. Than the yeah, larger it, bureaucratic organizations. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And hopefully we can get into that because this, this, uh, this idea of being agile and flexible is really the key um, to digital transformation. Being able to find opportunities and increases where other people are not able to get there or, or get there fast enough. So just by getting there sooner or being able to leverage an opportunity faster than your competitor is a huge competitive advantage. Even if it's a day or a month or a week ahead of time, these things can really help an organization make the difference between winning and losing in this ultra competitive market that we're in. I love it. That's great. All right. Because the entire audience would be disappointed if we didn't sure. jump to rapid fire. We're going, sure. to, we're going to play uh, some rapid fire. I know you know the rules. And I actually know, but you know, shoot, shoot, shoot away. Okay, well, let's just review them so that we have some clarity. I'm going to okay. give, I'm going to give you some options. You are to pick nope. one, okay, um, without explanation, and then we're going to rapidly go to the next option. You might right. even, you might feel uncomfortable, like with and feel like you need to explain why you picked chocolate or vanilla, but okay. you don't you don't get to you don't get to explain. So are okay. you ready? I am ready. All right. Well, good. All right. Here we go. Water still or sparkling? Still. Unix or Windows? Windows. Hamburgers or hot dogs? Hamburgers. Beatles or Stones? Stones. Call of Duty or Mario Brothers? Wow. Ooh, ooh. Mario Brothers. Texting or calling? Texting. Mac or PC? Mac. Standard or automatic? Automatic. Early bird or night owl? Night owl. Drama or musical? Musical. Plastic or paper? Plastic. Jazz or hip hop? Hip hop. Samsung or iPhone? iPhone. 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s music? 70s. Fall or spring? Spring. On prem or in the cloud? In the cloud. Star Trek or Star Wars? Star Wars. All right. I always let people explain that one because this is a tech podcast and people okay. get, people are very loyal to what they're loyal to and this is a okay. sen very sensitive topic so 
I'd like to know why you pick what you pick. Which one? On Star Trek or Star Wars or any of them? Well, the one that you just picked, so you need to explain yourself. Uh -huh. So on any of them, I'll just say for the last one, Star Trek. I, I really never watched Star Trek a lot as a kid. Uh, Star Wars was a little, it was um, more of a mystery to me because it's only in the movies. At least now they have series about Star Trek, but I mean Star Wars. But then you only get a hit every two years or so when you got Star Wars and the force, you know, the um, Return or Empire Strikes Back and Return right. of the Jedi. So it was more of a, you know, a mystery about what was going on. But you knew what was happening with Star Trek every week because it came on. At least, at least the reruns as a kid right. when I was, yeah, not trying to date myself. So that's that's really why, even you know, why um, I liked um, uh, Star Wars. But I'll tell you. Another thing I really liked on television was Battlestar Galactic. I was hooked on that when it was, you know, when I was a kid when that came on. That was like the Star Wars alternative on, you know, I guess in the eighties. I really loved that show. You know, when I was a kid. No, I might have to switch up this last question now that you bring that uh -oh. up. Okay. I might have to bring in Battlestar Galact Galactica uh -oh. as well. I remember. No, don't get any trivia questions though, because I'm going to fail. I only remember two characters from the show, so I'm going to I'm going to bomb it if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, you won't be any you won't be tested any further. <laughs> okay. Good, good, good. Let's let's jump into the topic that we're sure. discussing in depth this year at OT Mail around digital transformation, and we at the top of the show we did talk about it a little bit. Uh, especially, especially in your new role, but how mm -hmm. do you align transformations to corporate strategy or to the organ, not corporate organizations, organizational strategy? Well, so first out, you know, there's a premise in your question that I want to even challenge. All right, um, go for it. And that is that you can do digital transformation without having an organizational strategy. You know, I mean, and I say that because my experience has, uh, um, and I say these, I, I say I have good experiences and I have bad experiences, and some, of the, and I learn from all of them. And and I think when it goes well, there is a very tight alignment between strategy and the digital transformation. Mm -hmm. But when it doesn't go well, um, and when the expectations are you know are, are misplaced, is that you can throw digital transformation on top of a strategy that's really a legacy type of a strategy. Uh, or, you know, um, or there is not an alignment at, at all. And so we're expecting for technology to solve the problem of, of, of organizational strategy, you know, in terms of where we want to go, wh what kind of organization we want to be. Technology is an enabler of that. And digital transformations are, in, you know, a part of that digital, you know, is a part of it, um, um, the digital transformations. But the strategy is the strategy. It has to be the strategy itself has to be where are we going? Where do we want to be in let's say two to five years, three to five years? People do three year strategies, four or five year strategies, pick one. But where do we want to be? And of course, what are those metrics? I know we're gonna talk about that later. What are those things that tell us that we're doing well to get there? And then of course, now the technology needs to support that. And and, and so it's really important that we, you know, that we tie the technology toward meeting the objectives in the strategy document and that we as an organization are all lined in on making sure that that strategy is what it is. And those things that we say, those objectives are what we all agree to and are all held accountable to. Um, and then it makes the technology, technology is hard, of course, but it can be easier to kind of as a CIO to make a decision about what technology there is. And people kind of get caught into what technology to use, but it really, there are many technologies that would solve the problem at, at hand, but we have to be focused on the problem and then let the technology decision be the technology decision. It can't be the, the, the thing in a vacuum. And that's the problem that I've, I've seen in my experience uh, when we talk about digital transformation and absent in an absence of the, the organizational strategy, the the corporate or you know enterprise strategy, where are we going here? Uh, so um, so how do you do it? Is first making sure that it exists because I didn't again that's not a given. And I've seen most a lot of times it was not a given that there's a, an alignment between the two. But it, but when you do that, you know you start by laying out the objectives and you lay out plans to get to those objectives. And those are plans that are not just technology plans, they are plans in general, and then technology enables us to get there better, faster, and cheaper. I love it. That was a very comprehensive answer to what could be a, a very shallow response. So I loved it that you really got into the heart of it, I think. Um, and I want to pull that thread a little bit 
and sure. have the audience and yourself Matt, and draw on your past experience your role in all of that i mean you just mm -hmm. teed it up beautifully like sure. here's here's the fundamentals here's how it, it all plays together here's mm -hmm. how technology is an enabler and you know the transformation is a part of that journey but mm -hmm. Specifically, since this is a podcast and for for and about CIOs, huh. how does that role in your experience, maybe the good, the bad, and the ugly, on on how that can go really well or go really poorly, but really, mm -hmm. like on the racy chart, what's your role for as a CIO? You know what? Um, I think that is a, you know it's an interesting question, and I'm going to make it a little bit more complicated because the role. <laughs> I believe has um, has has more than changed for the CIO over the years as pertains to digital transformations. As you got into agile implementations, and we're expecting, and we should, by the way, expect CIOs to do more than just the technology. And so um, I, I consider that you know the, the, you know you know the, over the years the role of the CIO has been elevated, where it's no longer reporting to the chief operating officer or the chief financial officer gets reported directly to the head of the organization, the CEO and managing director. And in that way, the CIO has a role beyond just the technology. Clearly the technology, you know, decisions in terms of what technology to, to use to enable that business function is that of the CIO, but also um, thinking about what the things actually are and what, you know, the, the challenges could be and what, or what opportunities to make that may exist in terms of how we can actually get a better competitive advantage um is something that the cio at you know a good cio in an organization should embrace the cio who's actually contributing to the bottom line and not just being a cost center but also figuring out ways to create new digital products and maybe you know there's a way we can build an ai tool that gives us a competitive advantage and so the cio is no longer just technology he's also he or she also you know, have an entrepreneurial spirit and they're contributing to the conversation of driving the bottom line, just like other folks in the organization, the head of operations, the head of sales, the head of the finance organization. They are part of that. And I think that's the role of the of the of the CIO in a digitally digitally transformed organization. Um, he or she are going to be in the room, um, not just making technology decisions and guiding the technology, but also guiding the strategy and even the, the things that we consider to be the good things that leads us to getting to the good place for wherever this organization wants to go. I really loved what you said about the CIO having to be entrepreneurial. Um, and I also heard you have to be have awareness of your peers, what their goals and metrics are and what they're trying to get accomplished. Um, and you and you were really sitting right next to them as a part of their journey. Yeah, I, I would even take it further than that. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it is truly a collective journey. Um, and, and, you know, when we, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a study of, you know, organizational history, you know, that was my doctorate in this stuff. And I had to learn about organizations and how they form and in organizations over the years. I'm saying years ago, they formed as hierarchical organizations, military type organizations that were top down, um, driven by the top and everybody had their sections to take care of. You take care of finance, you take care of budget, you take care of HR, you take care of you know technology. And everybody had their respective things to work on. And that leads to a very waterfallish type of way of project managing things. You know, you, you dole it out, you know, and then everybody had their piece of the, you know, the strategic plan. So, you know, every, every year we meet the strategic plan and then IT has a piece of this plan that belongs to them. And then, you know, the finance team has a you know piece of the plan that belongs to them. And I, you know, this, I reject that premise as we move into, yeah. you know, modern organizations or organizations that are going to be ultra competitive. It, they are shared plans. So I, you know, I have a shared, not just that it's their goals, they're my goals. I want the CFO to win. I want the operations right. person to win. I want the chief, uh, chief of marketing to win. And he wants me to win also because we are all looking to, you know, to drive that, you know, the bottom line so we can all get the bonuses at the end of the year. So it is really about, you know, not just his piece of it, but it's, his piece is my piece or his piece, you know, her piece is my piece also. You know, it reminds me uh, uh, of when I remember someone telling me once, um, 
you know, I have my IT plan. We have our, our we have our, you know, our, our IT strategy. And it's like, wait a minute, isn't there just one strategy, right? So um, often as CIOs, we, you know, we're, we're planning our year and we're road mapping out all of our initiatives and we're, yeah. you know, getting our pieces and what resources do we need? And we do this annual mm -hmm. cycle. Um, uh, but we do ourselves a disservice if we call it an IT strategy versus, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes labels can get you in trouble, but that's what Particularly as you start to talk about it and, and, you know, saying it and talking about it as if it's a thing into itself. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the key thing. You know, I, I was once asked years ago, or well, maybe the place, you need to draft a technology strategy. All right. Well, tell me what your business strategy is. What are you trying to? Well, we don't have that, but you need to come up with a technology strategy. OK, what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and that can lead to and I've seen, you know, again, I've, I've, I've seen good, have good experiences and bad experiences. That can lead to technology being the driver and not the business. And I frankly, you know, I, I'm good at technology. I've been doing it a long time, but that's not what I am. I'm a person who's about business and leveraging technology when it's te when, when it's appropriate to drive the bottom line. But ultimately, it's still to drive the bottom line, to drive the margin, to drive the mission. That's what it's all about. And sometimes that's making technology investment, and sometimes it's not. Uh, and that's you know, <laughs> so it's you know, it's more than just you know, hey, this is my piece of it. We'll come up with a technology strategy. And then this gets back to, you know, the digital transformation question you asked earlier. It has to be aligned to strategy. And that strategy needs to be real for everybody. And I'm, I'm repeating that point because I feel, I feel like, um, well, I feel like my experiences show me that that strategy has not been real to many in the organization that I've been a part of. It's been a, a paper exercise, but it hasn't been real. We checked the box, we got a strategy, but it hasn't been something that, you know, that's driving the organization in terms of us uh, meeting on it on a constant basis, doing things about it and aligning ourselves to it in a very real and tangible way, day to day, weekly, monthly, to get to that place. Absolutely. I, I love everything that you just said. I agree a hundred percent. And it gets me to thinking about well, how do we do that? Um, and I meant I'm, I'm thinking of the entire organization and the levels of the organization. Um, and, you know, technology can definitely play a role, uh, but organizational change and how do you envision yourself in the strategy? Like, how does every employee envi envisions themselves in the strategy? If you don't, if it's a paper exercise. You don't even know what it is. Hard to envision yeah. yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is, um, you know, the one of the hardest parts of digital transformation or, you know, or just transformation in general right. uh, is getting the alignment of the organization, you know, from all parts of it, you know, uh, from the top down, from the CEO to all the C-suite executives of the organization to the directors and mid-level executives and on, on down. Everybody has to be lined up, but it does start at the top uh, and it starts at that C-suite level and people in the organization you know, and, you know, I'll get to this part about, you know, the things I learned the most and the lesson learned, but they are, uh, they, they get, get afraid. There's a real fear of moving the cheese, of changing certain things. People are aligned with what they've done. That's how we started. So this is what we ought to be doing moving forward. And sometimes things need to change. And that goes across the board. I mean, uh, that goes uh, not just across the board, but up and down in, in the organization. Um, and so, you know, getting, um, um, you know, just the, making the case for change at the executive level is so critical because the pe people are looking and saying, hey, you know, they're testing whether or not we're really committed to this this, this uh, transformation or not. And they will test it, they will test it, they will test it. And once you have the C-suite, you, know, you know, engaged and and committed to this change, and, and, and some may not necessarily want to go, you know, willingly, it, may, it has to come from the, the CEO and the boards, of course, themselves. The board of directors need to make sure that you know that uh, that the C-suite executives are being you know held accountable to that to that change. That's where it starts, and then from there, you know, that's you know, there's a uh, you know the, the carrot and the stick, of course. And I want to really talk about the carrot, right? And this is about the the case for change, and, and I think this is what makes leaders effective. I think this is what made me effective. Clearly, we need to do something different. Um, and we need to, you know, be competitive or whatever it is we're trying to, you know, get past. It could be a cybersecurity issue. We need to get off legacy platforms. A number of things that, you know, that could be the catalyst for the change. 
But the point is, you know, you know that needs to happen, but how do you now convince others that that, need, that needs to happen? But you do need to win, I would say, the argument in the case, you know, in a, in a court case. That's win the argument. We have to win the argument and make the case for change all the way through the organization. We can't continue the way we are. Yeah, and this is why. Continue to explain it. And then, you know, you know, that's hard enough. And then we have to find some, you know, okay, if you're saying that's the case, we got to change, Larry. You got to change, Lisa. Okay, what does that look like? So you got to find some some wins, some quick wins, some, some examples or, or find a champion within the organization and say, hey, look how we did this. You know, you can't bite the whole out, you know, to bite the whole, you know, or, 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 or boil the whole ocean or eat right. the whole elephant one bite. Let's take a bite and let's try this out and create some wins, some tangible wins. Not just in terms of the technology, but real bottom line things. We did this. Look how it goes, and look how it went, and look how fast. Flywheel going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, just to wrap it up, you have to, you know, it has to be alignment across the organization at the top. Um, they have to believe in it, not just believe it in, but they have to be held accountable for it. And it has to be absolutely real because people are looking. But once that case is made, we have to actually do some convincing. You know, and from coaching and evangel you know, evangelizing in terms of this new religion that we're about to, you know, to um, to start practicing as an organization. And there's no going back. And that has to be real as well, mm -hmm. uh, because people unfortunately will find ways or try to find ways to poke holes and to the change or, or find a way to go back to their happy, comfortable yep. place. But there's no comfort uh, <laughs> and growth. Uh, and I go and I go, you know, my philosophy is not to create comfort, but to create safety, create a place of safety so we can grow. Mm -hmm. And I know we'll talk probably about this learning part of this um, thing, you know, continuous learning. Um, but, you know, that's what it's all about. We, we, you know, you know, we just can't grow by being comfortable here. Um, and oh, I love that. I love that, Larry. Comfort versus safety. I'm, I'm, yeah. I am so going to steal that. That is like, that, <laughs> that's a beaut that's a nugget right there. Because yeah. you're right, I, you know that that's really that's 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 a gem right there. I'm gonna keep that one. But um, <laughs> let let's um let's talk about. So you just got everybody aligned. They they have they have art of war. They they have burned the ships. You know we are moving <laughs> forward, right? We're moving forward. Um, you're mm -hmm. taking us on this journey, Larry. We're at this yeah. place. We're we're now on this uh, new uh, adventure and. Yeah. In your experience, now you've landed on the land, what's the biggest challenge? You well, I mean, you know, uh, oh boy, if I've gotten that far, I'm really happy by the way. Yes, you her, are. Uh, but if I've gotten that far, uh, then, you know, and I've gotten a win out under the belt, then, you know, we have to now start to make this a part of the, the culture moving forward. And I talked to you about the premise of Transcend Digital Solutions, about technology. And of course, we got to burn old technology because we're not going back. But it's also about, you know, people, you know, the, the, the DOD would call it people processing technology. And we've already talked about technology. Well, what about the people, right? And the people are our most important asset, but I'm talking about people in terms of what they're, what they know, what their skill sets are. Uh, are they capable or, you know, uh, and, and trained um, and ready to actually go on this digital journey with us? Do we have the resources to make sure we support them in the way that we need to support them so they can, you know, be along this journey with us? Uh, do we have the right mindset in the organization? This is the cultural part of it. You know, um, are we, you know, are we truly adopting agile in the organization? Are we, or, or are we just saying, hey, that's for the technology organization to do agile. I want sprints, but I'm not going to present, uh, you know, to participate you know, the business side in the daily, you know, uh, scrum meetings or weekly scrum meetings or whatever. We want to be still do waterfall in the business side, but but agile on the technology side. Oh, so, you know, again, advocating for these kinds of things. Again, even the, the, the case of change never stopped, Lisa. What I'm, what I'm saying is, oh, right. I, we're not done. You know, constantly, constantly reinforcing the message of, here's how we need to operate. Okay, now we've burned the ship. Here's how we need to roll forward. Here's how we do this now. And here's how we, we move forward in terms of how we work with each other what the culture of the organization needs to be. Uh, do we have leadership challenges in the organization? We got to address those things. Do we, you know, clearly we talk about skill gaps, but also this, you know, this agility thing, I'm talking, do we have the right 
kind of leadership, and this is not to say we jettison everybody, which is we're doing a you know a constant assessment of our you know our, our talent, what we got, and then we're trying to close those gaps in every whatever means possible. Do, you know, how do we close these gaps, both in terms of having the right leaders, but also the right skill sets in the organization, and we're constantly working on that. So we're kind of with training plans, individually training plans for leaders, even bringing in executive coaches to help with this to to reinforce us along the way. And then that uh, last thing is the business process. Um, again, I talked earlier about this. Let's not try to you know, uh, drop new technology on an existing business process. I worked in environments where we had a 36 step process to do a thing and we got it down to eight. But the biggest bang for buck wasn't the technology. It was getting to business to agree that we can actually streamline this process. You know, bringing, working in with you know, the black belt six sigmas, you know, the, the, well, the green belt six sigmas, for the black belts, those are really important. The business process we have any part of this thing. That's a just as much of the part, if not more, of the digital transformation than the technology. And so constantly, you know, this is the Drucker principle of, you know, the continuous improvement, constantly tweaking our technology, but also constantly tweaking our business process, finding better ways, more efficient ways of building that mousetrap or whatever widget we're actually building or whatever service we're selling. What's a better, faster way, cheaper way, more efficient way of doing that thing? Or what are opportunities for new business? If that's the you know the organizational challenge that we have, because that's the agile organization and the, the very adaptable organization that we need to be able to be ultra competitive uh, in this in this ultra competitive environment here. And again, I, I go back to this word disruption uh, because you know it used to take years. For somebody to come come along and you know and come up with a technology or a business process to kind of scoop you out, but it can be done with AI now. Somebody can you know scoop you in a week, in a matter of weeks, and you can be out of business if you're not constantly you, you know looking for new ways of doing things, better ways of doing things, and that needs to be in your culture. And everybody needs to be out there scouting in your organization. So what are we doing about that, and how do we prepare our organization for that new? landscape that we're living in and that's the landscape for everybody to kind of be prepared you know to, to be working in well, that's uh, so many things that you just said sure. are, you yeah. know but i'm i'm thinking you know one of the i think we all and i'm sure you have to have been forced to lead a transformation when i'll use your words when the business is still using waterfall method methodology and mm -hmm. and we really need agile processes sure. to get us there um mm -hmm. and Across you, the board. yes uh, mm -hmm. everybody this is it's not just it having to be trained on you know what what is a scrum and right. you know right. you know you know it you know it, it's got to be the business side too and if um and how many times have in your career have you been asked to do a tech transformation when the business partner does not want to change their process at all right it's like you do that give me my tech transfer but stay out of my piece this is mine right and, and you know again with with these digital transformations you almost you're transforming the organization into a digital organization that's really what you're doing and so this the idea that the business process is owned solely by the business owner those days are the days of old I get to look as a technology professional in the organization also about that business process. I get to have a say, you know, and the finance, the CFO gets to have a say also, and vice versa. Right? You know, financially, the, the technology they have uh, clearly they have a say in what we do in terms of the technology, but it needs to be you know a joint type of thing. We get to look and and weigh in on whether that that makes sense or whether there's a better way of doing that. Uh, but this idea of you just give me the technology, Larry or Lisa, <laughs> you know that you know and. You know, I'll deal with it. That those days of that won't work again. Trying to be ultra competitive because it meant you, what you're also doing. You're shutting out the other minds that could be actually contributing to the mission. And no, oh, that you don't want to be there. You need all your brains in this organization going. You need them all. You look prospecting for new opportunities and better opportunity for you. That's what that's what a digital transformation is about. Also, hey, do we have everybody here lined up? We got. 200 people, I want 200 people scouting for new opportunities in the organization. That's what I, I want. Let's pull that thread a little bit more. People. Sure. People. Sure. How how do you how do you identify the right change agents? How do you I, 
how do you um you know you've got skill mm-hmm. gaps you got to deal with you've got cultural mm-hmm. gaps you gotta deal with you've mm-hmm. got you know perhaps um you know cheese you have to move but when it comes sure. to the people element of our people mm-hmm. process technology stool um sure. you know what are you know what are some best practices or how do you address or approach you know the the people part of of the formula mm-hmm. so um we talked a little bit about you know uh, m- making the case but one of the things i would say um and this is uh where the, the psychologist kind of comes into play here and one of the things i'll just frankly say that you know that i underestimate how afraid people are for change um, I, and sometimes you can make the mistake of thinking that the business case alone is enough, uh, and not account for the fear of change yeah. that it, it is palpable, it is real, um, and it's hidden and not, and not fully. They don't people don't talk about it, you know. But you have to address this thing, this fear, you know, dynamic uh, of you know of change, the fear of. Oh my God, my job is going to go away. You're taking my job away. No, we're not trying to do that, but we have to actually maybe make a new job for you. We're doing something different now. We don't need as many software developers anymore because we automated some of that stuff. We may not need testers because we're doing automated testing, but there are other roles that we have in the organization, maybe not necessarily within the IT organization, but still we need that, you know, that you know, knowledge in the organization. But that theory is palpable um, and we must account for it. Um, and so I would say one, you know, this, this love, this, the amount, the level of empathy, you know, empathy that you have to have and demonstrate to them about, I see that you're afraid about this, you know, and I see, you know, see your perspective, you know, and I get where you are. We have to demonstrate that, that we, you know, we're not just, you know, um, terminators here and we just find the weakness, think we made a decision, but then we, we're dealing with real people, you know, and we're dealing with real feelings that don't quite make business sense, but they do make sense in terms of how people feel about it. Um, we have to always have our, you know, we got to have our brains on, but we got to turn this on also. It has to be on super drive. This heart thing has to be on super drive. And it's super, I say super drive in terms of sensitivity, right? Yeah. Our brains are able to perceive things and make calculations. This is our feeler, you know, and we got to, we got to have that feeler on, you know, 24 seven, and it has to be able to, feel, you know, um, um, where people are in terms of the fear. And so we can make adjustments in terms of how we interact and address those fears, because we do need to drive out fear. Uh, um, We absolutely have to drive out fear in the organization. That is a killer uh, for so many different ways. It it will kill because people, you know, will leave when they shouldn't, or, you know, we can keep them, or they will shut down, or they will find ways to go back to what was the past. Oh, even so many ways fear can be a killer of your organization. So you have to do that. But once, you know, so, okay, not that you all, you know, you're constantly doing that, but you're also dealing with, you know, how do you get started? I think that was part of your question also. Right. We got to find who was that brave soul? You know, who's going to, you know, and I think that could be a person that could be a, a, a one business unit. Let's try this out. You know, and some, you know, you're going to get one or two or three or four a group of people like, hey, Blair, I heard what you said. Lisa, I heard what you said. It makes a lot of sense to me. I like, how can I play a role? Oh, okay. That's your entry. Always Let's grab them. Always grab yeah. them, right? Yeah. Yeah. I want to start with those, those, uh, those, you know, people who may be early adopters or, you know, who are, you know, a little braver souls. We're going to start with them and make the case and prove it, you know, both in terms of the technology that we introduced, but also in terms of, hey, it's not so bad in this. The water's not so bad over here. And we've gotten this done and we've trained folks up. We're going to make some success stories, you know, across the board, not just on the bottom line, but also how people felt as they went through the process, you know. Uh, so accounting for those feelings uh, are is critical. Now, I will say this because, you know, um, people will say, well, Larry, people are the most important asset, you know, in the organization. And they are. Uh, yeah. and, but I, but I would but I would be careful not to make the mistake of uh, of catering to the fears of the organization in organizational goals. We still have to go to where we're going, right? We still have to achieve these organizational objectives. We we got to go there, and so the fear can't take a, you know stop us from moving forward. Uh, and so, do we care about people's feelings? Yes, but you know, but we have to be able to do that 
in concert with going to this place because I've also experienced where you don't go there because the feelings became so strong that we stopped going. And, oh, that's, you know, we well, we have to go here. <laughs> we have to be competitive. We have to do these things to, to stay off disruption. If the fear is so palpable that you haven't dealt with as an organization um, and you're letting that fear drive your non-decision or your inability to actually get there, that could be a recipe for disaster that shows up long term. It may not necessarily be immediate, although it could be, but it could be a recipe for a long term disaster for an organization. Oh my gosh, I love this journey that you've taken us on today, talking from the beginning with like having this entrepreneurial spirit, being able to reckon, not only recognize fear, but being able to show um, a safe place that that's future holds and mm -hmm. pulling, being observant enough, using your um, psychology communication skills and, and um, you know, just good leadership skills of finding the right change agents to take on this journey, to demonstrate the safety, to not only demonstrate the safety, but how they can actually be enriched by the change. Um, gosh, such good nuggets a uh, waterfall versus agile um, I'm, I'm gonna steal a bunch of these um but um if you had i'm gonna ask you two more questions if you had to go back and look at you know all your depth of experience if there's something you would do differently like a, a big lesson learned for you mm -hmm. um and if you have if it's something you've already said that's cool but if is there something we're missing so, you know, I would say this, um, I, I'm not trying to skirt your question. That's okay. Um, I would definitely do things different if I knew more. And so here's what I didn't know more. No, um, I didn't believe in my own ability to lead as, mm -hmm. uh, as much as I should have. You know, um, I should have believed in myself more. And if I had done that, um, then I would have taken you know, more chances and push the ball a little bit further, you know, not only in terms of like the leadership, in terms of the technology, in terms of the bottom line, but also my ability to communicate, uh, my ability to be, um, 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 to embrace my, you know, uh, my vulnerabilities. If I'd done that, you know, realized that there was power in that earlier, I would have made some tweaks. I don't regret a whole lot of decisions that I made, but in terms of the approach, because the thing was the thing that we needed to do, but in terms of the approach of this, Again, have my head on, but also have my having my heart on. I would do things differently, and I would tweak certain things because the, the difference is at least small. You know how we communicate. You know how often we communicate. What we're saying to the right people at the right time. Those tweaks I would make, and so you know, and those could be that make a you know a, a bill of a difference. So I wouldn't say anything fundamentally different, but I would definitely have my a, a better sense of understanding of the world and understanding the sense of fear and how powerful it is having a better sense of how real it actually was because I, you know, I didn't have as, as many feelers on as I have now about those things. Mm -hmm. And so I would make tweaks in terms of how I would address those fears and help people through the change, the, the change, you know, in terms of where we need to go. I would, that's probably the biggest thing I would, ch you know, change. It's just more about having these feelers or more. You know? Well, you kind of answer my last question that I normally do. So sure. I'm going to actually switch it up a little bit on you. Sure. Sure. I usually ask what would you tell your younger self, which I think you just did that. Sure. Yeah. But but let's say um, you have a, a young professional who wants mm -hmm. to be Larry, who wants to be Dr. Anderson one day, and mm -hmm. they, they're just rolling, you know, maybe they're a junior in college or one more one more year left and they're about to like jump into adulting what is mm -hmm. your advice for this oh. young professional okay so two pieces one it can't be dr larry because there was only one and i'm not saying that from a place of ego right okay uh, yeah i want them to embrace who they are who they right? are i love it and be their 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 best selves uh, and i you know i coach a lot of you know young uh, you know up and coming leaders and my first question is that just you know, what makes you happy you know what drugs are you you know what are the what are the things that give you joy, uh, and that's and we build from that. You know, and then we find ways to build. You know, to get joy even in in the work. Like, right? you know, what do you, you know, can you get joy from doing this? And it turns out there are a lot of ways to getting joy in the work. 
You know, but it starts out with, with the, you know, what, what drives them, what makes them happy. What are the things that, you know, what is your happy place? You know, uh, and so, you know, it's just, just expanding the realm of what those things could actually, you know, what the activities they could be doing to get to that happy place. Turns out the happy place is actually, you know, getting wins or getting successes or whatever it is. And we can, you know, make some transition so they can find actually happiness at work. Even though it's work, there are ways of finding happiness in what we do if you make meaning out of it. You know, so that's what I talk to younger folks about is that happy place and then, you know, and making meaning out of what they do. Even if it's an rote thing, if they're doing rote things right now in the early part of their career, they got to do repetitive tasks. We can make meaning out of that. Here's how it ties to the greater thing that you're doing. Here's how it ties to your greater happiness. Here's how it ties to your organization's success. These, you know, you build from that. And that's what I tell the young, you know, younger uh, mentees that I talk to. I love it. But of course, that goes straight to my heart because uh, yeah. finding your joy is, um, you know, def- I, I do the exact same thing. So I loved your answer. I love talking with you today, Larry. Um, you. you just had so many wonderful words of wisdom that I know uh, our audience is going to enjoy. Thank you for sharing with us. Um, and um, I just, um, so many nuggets again, I'm going to steal. Um, yeah. Good stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Lisa. It's been great talking to you. Yep. Well, see see you guys next time. Take care, everyone.